So my name's uh, Sean Bose. Uh, today we're going to be doing a case. Uh, this case is out of the Darden 2015 casebook. Uh, it's titled Plastic Pellet Problems. Right. Hi. Uh, I'll be solving the case. So my name is Vivek from Darden Glass of 2016. I'm excited to do this. Awesome. So we're going to get started. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the client is a private equity investor who has recently purchased a plastic pellet manufacturing company. Okay. based in South Carolina. She has approached our company searching for several alternative solutions to improve EBITDA and firm value so that she can sell the firm for a profit within five years. How would you help our client solve this problem? All right, great. Sounds like an interesting problem. I think uh, just to be clear what we are looking at here, we are looking at a P investor and they just recently bought a company and want to basically increase the firm value and need our help. Yep. So I think I need to get some more idea about this client before I jump into thinking about how to solve this. So the first question I have is basically, what exactly do this company do, the ones they have bought? What does plastic pallet basically mean? The process I've not really worked in any such Sure, sure. So, so they buy uh, two different types of plastic. Um, uh, and they buy it from, it's recycled plastic. Okay. And, and they turn it into um, pellets that uh, companies use, like bottling companies, to create um, all sorts of products. But you can think of plastic bottles and blown film extrusion and injection molding. So they have a pretty diverse client base, but it's a, it's, it's a commoditized material that's used uh, for a broad range of plastic production companies. Okay. And I'm guessing they just are selling directly to the company, so it's B2B, there is no mm -hmm. distributor in between? Or yeah, there's no there's no real consumer demand for plastic pellets. Okay. So it's, it's all yeah, it's all manufacturing companies. All right, cool. Uh, I think the other thing I would like to know is, um, so this client which we have, um, so the company which the P investor has bought, uh, they're doing everything in-house in terms of manufacturing and those, uh, like in terms of their overall end to end supply chain, right now we can assume that they do everything. Yeah, I mean, they, they buy raw materials and then they own they own the product until it turns out as a plastic pellet. Yeah, they don't they don't contract out anything. Okay, all right. And the last question is in terms of the goal of the client. Uh, do they have any specific numbers in mind in terms of how much they want to increase the value by in time frame, anything like that? Yeah. So usually, uh, usually they're able to increase value by three x. So oh, over the okay. five year period. Uh, the private equity investor would like to see the valuation increase three times. Okay, all right. So in the five-year period, then they want to sell it uh, mm -hmm. at three x value, hopefully. All right. So can I take uh, maybe two minutes to just structure my thoughts here and then share with you how yeah. to solve it? Sure. Go ahead. All right. All right. So basically, the way I'm trying to think of solving this problem is first getting a better idea of the market, uh, the plastic pallets company which we have. Uh, acquired the client and finally understanding a little bit about the client and then finally having a after having a better idea of all this I want to look at some strategies for growing EBITDA uh, sure. within the revenue and cost buckets. So starting with the market I want to understand uh, how many competitors do we have, who are the players, what is the size of the market, how fast the market can be growing in the in the future and then also understanding about if there are any substitutes and lastly customer segments. So if there are any different segments which we can target or which we are good at. Uh, the company which we bought, basically the plastic pallets, I want to understand what their capabilities are, how are their current relationship with the customer, if that is a strength over here, because if you said it's a commoditized business, so strength would be very important in terms of relationship, and then what is their current market share, and historically how they have been doing, so if they have been growing, have they been doing something well, which we can keep that trend going. Uh, in terms of the PE client which we have right now with us, I want to understand uh, if there any synergy is possible, so for that I want to look at revenue and cost synergies and that we can understand based on what their current portfolio of companies are. And lastly also if in the past they have acquired any similar company and have some experience of trying to grow these kind of companies. Uh, lastly in terms of growing EBITDA as I said revenue and cost strategies. So from a revenue standpoint I generally try to look at price and volume as a driver to increase uh, the overall revenue and also looking at the mix. In terms of price and volume it's uh, price would be just looking at if there's any chance or there's commoditized to see if we can take more pricing and for volume we can look at certain different push and pull levers in terms of marketing or sales and also like if we have certain innovative products if it, I know it's commoditized but if we have some new technology sure the last thing is fixed cost variable cost in terms of cost synergies and if we go deeper into that if cost is a major driver then I would like to draw value chain and look at it sure later so first, like all right so to start with I want to uh, maybe start from uh, understanding the 
market itself. Okay. So if if I can get an idea how how many competitors are there, and if it's a really market which has a lot of uh, too many competitors in terms of the number of players, and it's pretty regional. Uh, so within the region, there's really not a competitor. Um, you know, transportation costs are significant. So um, within our region, we're, we're we have number one market share by a, a pretty strong um, amount. Uh, okay. But we don't really play that much outside of the call it su southern or southeast United States. Oh, okay. I think so. One thing that comes from this is one hypothesis could be that maybe we can look at increasing their EBITDA by trying to expand to other markets. Mm -hmm. But just to keep in mind that it might be a long term strategy and we have to look at a five year strategy here. So if it's possible within the five year time frame, but that's something for company to look at. So I'll just make a note here uh, outside Southeast US. This is one strategy. Uh, then in terms of the growth of this market, is there any demand which we can see to like growing and capture that or customer segments which are particularly growing or it's a very stagnant? It's a flat market and okay. uh, all, de all national demand is currently being filled. Oh, okay. National demand. So just to uh, again clarify one more thing. So you say national demand is being filled, that means other regions have other players who are strong and they are filling that. Yep. So, okay. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so then, then my one hypothesis is that this is possible but if it's all being filled, that means these uh, players have good relationships built already in the B2B, so it might be difficult to break those in the short term. Yep. So we might want to consider that, but as I said, long term. Moving into the uh, plastic pallets uh, at the company itself, so do we have any idea of what is it that their strength is in terms of how they have this high market share doing something better than competitors? I, I mean, I think you were right. It's, it's mainly relationships. Um, so. Uh, it's a commoditized product, so it's relationships and, and price. I mean, those are the two things that really matter to uh, the customers who are buying this product. You know, okay. think about somebody who's manufacturing garbage bags, for example. The quality is, is not really that big of a deal. It's, it's mainly who, which suppliers can provide us the uh, the cheapest plastic pellets so we can turn it into a consumer product. Well, wow, okay. So I think, uh, I won't do, go too much deeper into this, but one uh, hypothesis which comes out from this area of analysis is that uh, reducing cost could be an important strategy because that would help us reduce price and get more volume. Yep. So that could be a way to increase overall revenue as well as uh, profit margin in the okay. future. So cost reduction is something we can look at later. All right. The next thing was in terms of synergies. Uh, does our client, P client, have any similar companies in the portfolio? Or have they, they done anything in the past? They years? don't. So they tend to buy oddball manufacturing companies. Um, okay. You know, that we're, we feel like the PE company is good at, um, you know, uh, bringing management experience. So we do think that there are probably some levers we can pull, but there's nothing okay. specifically that we've done before that relates to the plastic industry. There's no company that we're going to be able to sell to or, or yeah. leverage. So. There's no direct synergies, it's just we think we can put better management in place and do some of the things that you talked about, like potentially increase volume or, or decrease costs. Okay, great. All right, so I think based on overall understanding of the market, two things which I feel are one is long-term strategy could be to expand outside Southeast Asia and once we go into growing EBITDA, cost reduction would be important, which we'll look at. Mm -hmm. Moving into now the part which I saying growing EBITDA, I want to first start on the revenue side, although Cost is important, which we'll draw values in later on. Okay. But in terms of revenue uh, increase strategies, one I was thinking of is so you said price is important, so we look at cost reduction to reduce price. In terms of volume, uh, the only thing I was thinking is if there's any possibility to uh, acquire any other smaller players to gain volume or do anything in that area to gain volume, apart from re reducing price, is there anything we can do? To gain volume now. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually, our current facility is operating at capacity and uh, we're capital constrained, so we don't we don't feel like acquiring a new factory or any new capacity is, is something we're willing to do, given the short time period and the heavy capex associated with, you know, being able to increase capacity. Okay, oh, all right. So one thing which comes out from this is that we are capacity constrained. So what that tells me is that uh, one long-term strategy is obviously to try and increase capacity, which you said is long-term, but other is going into now, the, the part I was going to do into next is product mix. So trying to see if we have different products and are we maximizing our capacity to produce more of products which we can make more money out of. So maybe I would like to go into deeper into this. So do you have any 
Uh, yeah. What are the biggest of product lines we have right so now? Two products, um, and it's derived from uh, where we get our, our raw materials from. So we get raw materials in two places, post-consumer scrap. Okay. So you think of that as like plastic bottles. And then manufacturing scrap. So you can think of that as, hey, we ship product to a garbage bag manufacturer, they trim off the edge of their roll, and they send that trim back to us. Okay. Um, the the post-consumer plastic can only be used for new consumer products, whereas the scrap manufacturing plastic can be used for anything. So it's, it's more pure, right? It hasn't gone to the customer, it hasn't gone and had soda in it, so it's not as dirty. And so um, the scrap manufacturing plastic is a little bit more versatile. Okay. So uh, can you just have more clarity what is new consumer product exactly? So what are the like, so it's just bottles and... Yeah, you think of it as bottles coming back, right? And so that's a little dirtier where scrap manufacturing is something that was our plastic pellets and okay. somewhere in our customer's value chain it got cut and so it comes back to us in relatively pure form and so we can still use it for broad, a broader amount of applications. Okay, interesting. All right, so do we know uh, which product makes more margin and right now what is our capacity utilization of like how much you produce of what? Uh, so the manufacturing scrap is, is a higher margin product. Okay. Um, we don't have an idea of the of the mix, like in terms of what, how much we make of each, but we do know that we have a lot of inventory. Um, we're sitting on a lot of inventory of the post-consumer. Okay. So that gives me one hypothesis could be that we are currently producing more of post-consumer. Yeah, uh, that's why we have more inventory, or there is lower demand, and that's why people are not buying. But as you said, demand has been being fulfilled overall. Yeah. So there must, if there was more demand, we would have easily sold it. So it seems like we are producing more than what the demand could be. Uh, yeah, I and mean, actually, we think we think for the manufacturing scrap, um, even though all the demand is currently being filled, we we know that the uh, we're, we're very competitive on price, and so if we were to potentially switch more to the manufacturing scrap we can sell most of that stuff. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I think as you had mentioned, constraint, capacity constraint is there, so we should surely tell our client that one of the things they can do is to try and change their mix in terms of production. Yeah. Figure out how difficult or easy it is in the short term. I, my hypothesis is that these are not really different products, although it's coming from different recycle waste, but in terms of the process itself, it shouldn't be that difficult to shift to based on some some experience that I have in manufacturing, I, I would say that, okay. that that should be possible in the short term. So we should tell our client to produce more of the higher margin product. Okay, and that's a good. I think that's a good conclusion. Let's let's move to the cost side of the equation. So right, we're we're capacity constrained. Um, we can't really increase volume. I mean, we can switch to higher margin product. I think that's a good idea. When you walk into this factory for the first time, how are you thinking about cost reduction? All right. So. I think as I was trying to put a little bit here, when I think of cost reduction, I try to think of it from a value chain standpoint. Sure. And considering that this client is very unique in terms of they, they're in the recycled waste business, so they are also collecting some of the recycled waste. Okay. So I might want to also include that part a bit to see if there is some cost reduction. So I'll just draw out a value chain and then show you how I'm thinking of it. Sure. So they, they, there's two pieces to it, so going to be raw materials, so this would be supplier, uh, manufacturing ops itself, uh, distribution, uh, and last would be sales and marketing. So these are the four areas I think of in terms of uh, looking at ideas to reduce cost basically. Okay. So starting with the supplier side in terms of raw materials, uh, over here I'm thinking that if we have multiple suppliers, so trying to consolidate could be one idea. Suppliers, second could be trying to change the supplier mix to get uh, lower suppliers to give us more and maybe mix it around a bit. Okay, I think that's uh, a good idea. Third idea would be like just in terms of how the disti how the the distribution part works for getting the raw materials, so like transportation itself, and also like the collection of this waste or how that whole process works. So I would just bucket it into transportation overall, transportation slash 
uh, collection somewhere around that area so if there is a idea to reduce this by working with some other third parties or things like that in terms of manufacturing operations there are quite a few things we can do one is uh, increasing uh, maybe the utilization of our machines okay to reduce our per unit cost by producing even if the demand is not there we can try and use less time of labor or something like that yeah uh, labor utilization utilization can be machine and labor both so i'll not shift it i'll just put machine and labor the other thing in terms of manufacturing ops would be uh, just uh, i think in terms of the i think uh, capacity utilization is one what else trying to think was fixed uh, so manufacturing overhead so this what i'm thinking is like people who are managing the so the workers if we are utilizing them properly and if we have too many of those uh, the last thing would be just in terms of the machines we use and like one one idea would be but this could be a long term but if we are using machines which are too costly can we have like technical upgrades so long term ideas for that could be there and i think the last thing which just came to mind is maintenance so how can we reduce our maintenance cost yeah yeah so then going into the distribution part i think this is fairly simple we need to look at consolidating our orders to customer uh trying to fill up our uh pallets or whatever we send them in to okay. in terms of the trucks and just the third party we are using for distribution okay okay i think it's a list so okay. i think you hit on one of them let's talk about specifically reducing the raw materials costs okay so interesting what i have here is an exhibit that i'm going to fold so it's a little cleaner to see okay so you mentioned raw materials costs this is what we have for our exhibit so uh using that um can we or what's the lowest cost um procurement plan for our raw materials so we're just looking at the this is just for the um we'll say this is just for the post consumer plastics so this is just one of our two um raw materials so okay. we're going to focus on the, that one because it's bigger for now all right great so the way I, what i'm looking at here is we have four different suppliers okay and they have different capacities obviously and they also provide different pricing yep for uh, different tons we bought back from them so if i'm reading this correctly here it says price dollar k so i'm guessing it's 3000 dollars per per ton yep 3000 dollars per ton if we purchase in 100 ton increments yes okay and the 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 thinking here is that if we order more they will give us lower per ton so that's why this 3000 goes down to 2500 yeah so the bulk order so specifically it's because that's that's the right size for they have a standardized container they put things in okay and so intuitively you would think that if you order anything a lot of times you get a volume discount you get it at any number over but actually you only get this 250 this 2500 per ton price at exactly 500 tons because that's exactly what fits in one of their standardized containers okay and so any time they have to ship a partial they're going to charge you more and that's why they, that, that explains the price differences here and here okay so if i'm understanding correctly in case we want to order 600 or 700 we wouldn't get more discount right you pay fact, yeah. we would have to pay 100 ton increments for above 500 above oh yeah so the first 500 you would get this yeah. per ton and then for the second you know 100 or 200 yeah, 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 you would you would pay that yep exactly that's that's a great clarifying point all right so just based on this what i'm thinking is that uh one of the insights from here we could generate is we should only use uh, a and b for bigger quantities okay uh if we want to order 500 or if uh, they are really cheap even at the 100 level okay otherwise there's no point ordering all 1000 from one supplier so we might have to make a mix strategy here instead of ideally when we when i used to work in my old company we would try to consolidate everything to one supplier but here it looks like just because of the way this industry is and that whole standardized container piece seems like we need to make a mixed strategy okay so the way i'm going to approach this i'm going to lay it out for you so maybe before that i'll just explain so i'm going to look at unit cost for uh, all these suppliers at the different levels 100 tons and 500 tons and for the unit cost i'm also going to add uh, sorry 
I'm also going to add the transportation cost, which okay. is per ton, I'm guessing. Yep, yep, that's correct. And just another clarifying question is, this transportation cost is not changing as we order more. So it's going to stay the same no matter how much we order, 100, 200, 300. Yeah, that's accurate. All right. Because ideally, we could see that reduced, but I guess in this case. It's yeah, as a third party um, you know, vendor that we use, um, I think you're right. I think that might be a lever we can pull as well. So okay. uh, in the long term. In the long term. In the short term, we, if, if we're going to assume this is fixed, we'll just assume that that's the first time price. It doesn't change the value. All right. Transport cost is fixed for now. Long term. All right. So, yeah. so I'll just use a new sheet here. So A, B, C, D, total cost per ton, 100 tons, and 500 tons. All right. So if you look at the price is $3,000 per ton. Yep. So it's going to be $3,000. So this is per unit, right? So this is per one kg, 0 0.25. Per per ton. It's 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 in thousands as well. So it's two hundred fifty dollars per ton. Oh, it's in thousands as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So then it's going to be three thousand dollars plus uh, twenty five two fifty. Yep. Dollars per ton. So that's three two five zero. Okay. Per ton, and if I want to convert it into per lower than the per ton, I divide by thousand. Yeah. If, if we go per kg, or we can just keep it as this. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So three two five zero here. So this. So I'll just keep adding. So two point four plus point five. So that's uh twenty four hundred plus five hundred. This is twenty nine hundred. Uh, this is going to be uh twenty four hundred plus one hundred. So this is twenty five hundred. And the last one is 2500 plus 500, which is 3000. So here it looks like C is the best. I'll just fill up this table for the 500 ton is done. So it's going to be 2500 plus 250. 2500 plus 250, so this is 2750. And here it's going to be 2400 plus 500. So it's going to be 2900. Sure. Yeah, 500 tons? Yeah, I'm just multiplying this by 1,000. What, what are you pointing to right now? Uh, B. B what? Oh, yeah. It's 2.35. There we go. So 2, 3, Should be cheaper, right? Yeah, logically yep. I didn't see the no, no 2.35. Yeah, so 2850. All right. Uh, so I think from based on earlier discussion, it's better to go for the cheaper here, okay. the cheapest out of all, okay. because there is no benefit of going above 500 for A or B. So I would want to start with C. Okay. And C has the cheapest uh, at 100 ton level. Okay. And they have a capacity of 200. So I would ideally want to use up all their capacity. Uh, so if I make a, a sourcing plan here, sourcing plan using this table, I'll just put this here. Yep. So sourcing plan would be 2500 uh, for C. So use all 200 tons from C. Okay. The second would be, looking at this, it's 2750 is the second cheapest, which is for A. And they have a capacity of 1000. So we can order all 500 from them. Uh, so I would at least order 500 tons from A. So that gives me for 2750 per ton, per ton. So the total is 700. Now we need to fill the remaining 300. So what I'm thinking thinking now is that we have already used up C, so we can't go for the 100 ton level at C. So now we have to go back to 100 ton level because we are left with 300. Okay. So we cannot use the 500 ton anymore. So now again, we have to go back here, and That's the cheapest sense. looks like B, okay. the, sec the second cheapest, okay. and they have 500 tons available. So I would go with B at 2900 per ton, and we would get 300 tons. Okay. So if we want, we can calculate the total cost uh, and no, nah, I think we're good. I think so. I think yeah, but that does basically multiply twenty five hundred times two hundred plus. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think what we can see from this, you know, knowing what we spent last year, um, you know, on average last year on a per ton basis, we were just we were just paying um, a 
at the hundred ton level. Oh, okay. So, well, so, so we save quite a bit. Yeah. So it seems like this is seems like this is a good lever to pull in terms of uh, yep. in terms of doing that. So, given given everything we've done, um, you know, a private equity client uh, would like to know, you know, just get a quick update on the work that we've been doing. Um, what would you What would you like to share in terms of getting towards this uh, this goal that, that she's laid out? All right. So can I take a few seconds? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Okay, so I would uh, share with our client a few strategies to increase their EBITDA by three times and increase their market value in terms of short term and long term. For short term, the two main strategies which we feel right now is one to change their product mix in terms of their capacity, what they're producing because they have the manufacturing scrap which is higher margin and ultimately that will be able to drive more profit uh, and change your capacity mix, uh, use your capacity better. And the second is overall reduction of cost in terms of operating efficiencies, uh, which would ultimately drive down your price as well and increase your volume to get, capture more market share. So within specifically within the operating efficiency improvement, one area is also supplier sourcing strategy change, which would ultimately drive down your cost quite a bit, which we did an analysis on in terms of uh, three different suppliers which you should look at. In terms of the risk, you need to be, uh, sorry, the long term strategy quickly would be one is to try and go outside the current region we are in, which is Southeast US. And the second is transportation wise, if we can make changes so that we can get cheaper for higher uh, volumes. The risk of all these is, the biggest risk I see is the timeline itself because these are different strategies, they need to quickly make changes within the five year period. Yep. So really figuring out if they can do that. Uh, so for that the next step would be we could help our client build an implementation plan and take it to the next level for them. Good. All right, great. All right, so we're going to do some feedback now. Uh, I'll start by just having uh, Vivek talk about how he felt like it went. Um, and maybe if you want to talk about one or two techniques um, that you use, like the value chain that you found particularly useful throughout the process, go ahead and do that. And then I'll offer some some of my guidance, and, and uh, then we'll take a look at some alternative ways to do some of the stuff. So go ahead. How did you how did you feel like you go? Yeah. So I think it was overall quite a uh, case which covered a lot of areas for for in terms of a business. So I think I did overall quite well. Actually, I think uh, I covered majority of understanding the business and then going into different strategies uh, could have like obviously been uh, I guess a little better in terms of I, I felt in one part where I was doing the value chain I was trying to come up with strategies I got a little stuck for a few seconds but I think uh, overall as long as you can pick it up and show that you are in control of the situation it, it doesn't matter that much so that was one part and I think overall it went very well for me. Yeah, so, so this is definitely a pass. This is a first round case. This would be a very strong pass or a first round in my opinion. Uh, I think overall the VEC hit all the major points um, and, and everything was great. I'd say the one the one improvement piece for, for Vivek would be, be a little more conversational. So like when you're doing the supply chain, and again, this is personal preference for a lot of folks, but I would, I'd bounce things off and be like, yeah, this seems important. Does that seem important to you? Yeah. Um, the longer, you go without engaging the interviewer, the more they might check out. And, and I check I mean, out. Then, I think that. Then, then I, mean, I catch a math mistake. So again, he made a quick, he made a quick math mistake. He just drew the wrong thing from the table. Yeah. Totally fine as long as you recover from it quickly, which he did. Um, I mean, the, the the framework was great. It was robust. Uh, moving through uh, and having initial hypotheses throughout, and then being able to bring those back in the recommendation are all great things. To stimulate so. Uh, yeah, a lot of different movie pieces in this one, but I think a good job overall. Yeah, I think there's one thing to add, since you mentioned that trying to not be too mono monologue, try to have a conversation. Yeah. One way to do that and good strategy I've felt for me is that trying to bring in your experiences as much as possible, not just work, but in general what you see, talk, maybe you've talked to a friend about that business before. Yeah. Just trying yeah. to show that you're aware of like general knowledge kind of thing and street smartness maybe, and that kind of has a good way to con have a conversation with the yeah, so, so like I actually worked in plastic and so when I had this case last year, I was like, well, you know, I know the types of customers that use this, you know, I'm guessing it's commoditized product, but I'm also guessing that we probably can pull some levers on the supplier side because I know Exxon Mobil sells this stuff and so do small boutique firms that sell higher quality but higher cost products. So I'm curious about our customers, is quality important or not? And who exactly are we selling to? The opposite can be true too though. If you have no experience, I did a satellite case and just be like, I have no idea. Like, that I imagine that this is important. What do you think? And they, then the interviewer will share with you, because most of the time these are derived from 
um, actual real cases that the interviewers have done with the company. Yes, yeah. and I have no idea of that. It's so that's yeah. why in the beginning I tried to clarify that quite a bit, like in terms of business model and who they sell to, and that's very important in terms of understanding the business model before you get where deep uh, deep dive into your structure. So, just to share some things which work for me. So, first of all, in terms of just the structure. Uh, this was a fairly heavy structure like in terms of having a lot of moving pieces like understanding the market, the company which we have bought and the client. So in a PE case it's always very important to separate out the client because there's a synergy part which you have to always try and hit up on and it's always something which great candidates do. And then there is this plastic pallet company part which I tried to touch upon. So that was that moving part and also there were some strategies on growing the EBITDA. So we have revenue and cost. So ideally. Uh, if you just have to look at growing the strategy or growing the income, you should just focus on like something like a value chain to reduce cost and like for revenue you should look at price, volume and maybe push, pull, lever, something like that. So here I couldn't give more ideas in increasing revenue because I had to understand other stuff but you should always have in depth in your structure as much as possible. I think just the other part which I would say which a lot of people miss which I think was important in this case is the product mix part. So trying to hit up on that and trying to understand which brings more margin. Sometimes it could be channel mix, so the customers itself. So just understanding this mix part and trying to use that as a lever is always important. And I think the last thing I would want to quickly touch upon is this piece on the overall value chain. I think this has helped me the most throughout my case interviewing uh, in the last one year. Uh, it could be used just for cost reduction strategies, but it could also be used in terms of generally understanding capacity constraints or sometimes it could be used in the future part like sales and marketing strategies and cost reduction for that side. So I think this value chain is always very important to understand for any business and using that. Yeah, I think apart from that just structuring your math and having this, uh, you know, explaining to the interviewer before you do it and structuring it properly and, and I think the value chain itself can be also used as a brainstorming for different buckets. So that's a good way to brainstorm for cost reduction. Action. Action. So what we're going to do is uh, two really important parts of this case are the structure and the recommendation. And so the intent here is just to show that they can be done in different ways and still be successful. So I'm going to go ahead and run him through my structure. So you can see right here, here's his structure. This is my structure. So I'm going to go ahead and, and run him through it. So here's some things I'd like to consider when looking at this PE client and trying to increase the valuation of this company. So again, the objective is to get 3x valuation in five years. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about this in two ways some external factors and then internally within our current factory. So I'll start here because this is the most important. Obviously, increasing EBITDA means we need to either increase volume, price, or reduce costs, okay. or we need to get a better product mix. So those are the first areas I would probably want to look at. My initial hypothesis here is that costs, particularly fixed costs, and, and maybe the types of companies that private equity firms buy tend to have um, you know, kind of a fat management structure, so I'm thinking overhead costs and also direct labor costs are probably not optimized. So that would probably be the first place I would look. And then in terms of other, really looking at what options we have besides playing around with our current factory. So we're a PE company, I'm thinking that there might be synergies with some of the things that we have. We could vertically integrate, so maybe that yeah. makes sense for us to go back and, and acquire or to go forward and actually be consumer facing and make these consumer products that we aren't making now. Also expanding our footprint. Um, you know, in the prompt we talked a little bit about how we're just sort of a regional player, so why not why not get bigger you know, over a five year period? I think that that's a realistic goal. Um, and so to inform some of these decisions, I need to know a little bit more about who's, who else is playing this space, you know, what kind of products do they offer, what kind of products do we offer, can we potentially offer new products, and can we get new customers that way. But as I mentioned before, there's a lot of factors under the volume, the price, uh, the cost, and then also product mix. So I, I think I'd first just start here with the volume and want to know, are we at capacity? And, and if not, what can we do to drive up volume? Um, you know, what can we do to drive up price? The main thing I'm thinking about here is what are the customer segments, what are the different types of products we make. Fixed costs, again, I think overhead is a big one. And under variable costs, I'm thinking that direct labor is the lever we want to pull. And then also, once we know the other products, do we know the margins of those products? So let's go ahead and start with volume. You know, do we know are we at capacity or not? Because my initial thought is, if we're not at capacity, we should drive up volume. Right. So again, Good. just a different way to do it. I don't know if you have feedback. Uh, but again, you can see there's a lot of similarities and there's certain things that you need to capture, like the profit tree, but um, there's, di there's different ways to tackle this and be successful. Yeah, and I think uh, there are some ideas here which would be like the, the vertical and uh, horizontal, uh, vertical 
integration and forward and backward integration. So a lot of people miss that, and that's a great idea to think of, especially in a manufacturing heavy company. And and apart from that, just generally like new products, new customers. Yeah. So I think it's a great. So now we'll just do the recommend the recommendation portion slightly differently. So I'll set Vivex recommendation here, my recommendation here. Um, so again, if he had asked me, you know, to be clients in the room, what do you want to do? I took a second. My recommendation is uh, to improve the valuation of this company 3x in five years. That we need to do two major things. The first is uh, new supplier contracts. Uh, so we know that our current supplier contracts aren't optimally set up, so we're going to renegotiate those. And also, we need to shift to our higher margin product, which is the post manufacturing scrap. There's two major risks with this strategy. The first is that we're going to lose customers uh, because I know we have inventory right now of this product, but if we reduce volume too much, we might lose customers, and those might be valuable strategic relationships. So I'd like to know okay. a little bit more about that. I'm also concerned about new suppliers. We didn't talk a whole lot about quality or delivery, and so maybe the reason why these guys are lower cost is because they're not as good in some of these other dimensions, and so we need to do a full vetting of our suppliers to figure out if that makes sense. So the next steps are gonna be vet the suppliers, uh, explore the implications of possibly losing customers in the post-consumer scrap business, and then also, uh, I think we just need to dig a little deeper into the total cost structure of this company because I think there's probably other levers we can pull given how bad the supplier network was that, that, that are gonna further increase EBITDA and increase the valuation. Again, not better or worse, just different. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing better compared to mine is that uh, sometimes it happens, so like in my case, the time I felt was a little crunch, so I couldn't cover more risk and next steps. So. Here it seems there is a lot more risk and except so if sometimes you can't even write it down if you think of it just mention it and it's always important to look at risk and next steps as important. Uh, so the first company we're looking at is an auto manufacturing company and so I was given this in a case last year and basically asked you know we have an issue and a you know we're not selling enough cars or the cars are too expensive you know what 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 would you like to explore to figure out how to solve this and so. Uh, in real time, I have it pre-built here, I was drawing this out. So, all right, well, you know, if our costs are up, then we need to look first at raw materials. Um, you know, I'd like to know the price points of these over time and just see how it compares to competitors and also compare to how it's been in the past, because that could be a potential place where cost has gone up. Uh, you see I've drawn these little triangles here. Those are basically stand for inventory. So in each of these steps, I wanna know what, how much inventory is built up. And I'm particularly worried about storage space in this case to make sure that we're not running out of space um, you know, I can't imagine if we run out of space in any of these steps and we're storing these materials outside or not accepting deliveries, that, that could be a bad thing for the whole supply chain. Uh, so that's the main thing I'm looking at receiving. Obviously assembly, so here I mean the actual manufacturing process is really important. I don't know a lot about car manufacturing, so I've just kind of generically labeled the key processes up here. But for each of these key processes, I want to know utilization, quality, and cycle time, because these are the three levers that we can pull to increase uh, throughput, which again, maybe our issue is that we're just not selling enough cars, we're not spreading our fixed costs over uh, enough units. Following that, I'd like to know about outbound shipping. Again, I'm thinking about storage space here. Uh, do we have enough room, and then is this process efficient, or is there a bunch of inventory built up here as well? The trucks to the dealers, so there's a lot of different things I'm thinking about. Are these things leaving full? How often are they leaving? Uh, are we paying the drivers? Is this subcontracted? So I think there's a lot of factors here to consider. Uh, and then again, we may not own our dealerships, but I'm curious about the dealership structure uh, and how they're selling, particularly the sales force and how they're incentivized. So again, maybe we just have the wrong incentives in place and that's why this particular car model might not be selling or might not be selling at a price that we're happy with. And then finally, uh, the customer buying behavior, what, what gets them into a new car? Uh, obviously, whenever you're doing a value chain, you should, you should figure out you know, what, what makes the customer uh, actually want our product. So. Another company or another style of ops value chain we wanted to cover is basically, as we said, service ops. And the company I'm looking at is Wild Safari. So I'll give a brief idea of how you can lay out a service Wild Safari kind of company, and then I can give you how you can replicate it for other service-oriented uh, businesses. So the way I think of it, uh, it can be a little upside down from what Sean just showed, wherein the sales and marketing is like right, right at the end. You can think of it in a different way where for a service company, the starting step would be how do you acquire the customer or consumers and that part has certain areas you can look at. And then once you acquire them, how do they come to your store? So what are the process involved in that? So in this wild safari, it will be how do they buy the tickets for the safari, etc. And then when they come to your safari, in this particular case, it could be in another country. So how do they come and stay in a hotel and the transportation piece? So that can be the process of coming to that place 
and then after that you will look at how the service is delivered so providing that particular experience which is the wild safari and the last step is the post service so what happens after the service is done so starting with acquiring consumers what you want to look at is basically the sales force effectiveness uh, your marketing effectiveness because you're spending all these dollars you want to make sure you use it effectively in both the cases and then the next thing would be just the training of your sales marketing team and their product knowledge skill know-how these things are all under cost as well as strategies to make sure it's efficient in terms of quality to acquire the customer in terms of consumer buying you are looking at uh, how do they buy the tickets for this wild safari so relationships with travel agents which you might have so that they can buy more tickets you might have your own online portal so managing your website and how do you reduce cost with that and then selling if you might be selling tickets if you have uh, stores located in certain countries how do you reduce your store cost and personnel over there so that is in the buying part once the consumer comes to the safari like the trans to that particular area so they might be traveling through an airline living in a hotel or having some personal lodgings you want to reduce cost in those areas by maybe giving bulk discounts or bulk bookings and having a relationship with these hotels and airlines coming to the providing wild safari experience piece you want to look at the main component here are the guides who are doing the safari so how do you have the cost or the cost for the labor also how much do you train them what is their skill set so to deliver high quality which is very important for ops then the other thing is the transport vehicles you have so you need to reduce the cost by having a supplier who can give you cheaper transport vehicles next would be the fuel itself which you want to use for these transport vehicles and the last is permits with the government so government relationship uh, last thing in terms of post service you are looking at sending surveys to these people so what is the mechanism for that website uh, customer service agents in terms of learning about their experience and the last thing would be having a referral system so you can continue to have people coming to your business so this is i think would cover could this could be applied to any other service like maybe a car wash company or companies which provide service like uh, even like a i would say like i don't know like it service companies it could apply to many service companies basically this kind of one yeah. anything you want to add no i think starting so i think two ways to do this you can start with the raw materials which is what i chose to do or you can start with the customer uh, both work, but in a business like this, obviously, I think starting with the customer is, is more important. So, 